Well, is everybody all right today? Well, I hope you um, had an interesting time trying to ferret out the concept of the image of God and the concept of sin, the concept of, uh, of uh, idolatry and so forth, because uh, that gives you a good opportunity to seriously dig into something which perhaps we've just covered a little bit lightly. Uh, when you're doing a course like this in which the whole history of Christian ethics is, is kind of uh, looked at just as a glance, one of the things you have to understand is that in Christianity, theology and ethics are not separate things. You can separate uh, ethics from theology in almost every uh, perspective. But in Judaism and Christianity, there is no way for theology and ethics to be separated because what you do depends on who is your God. What you do is depend, dependent upon what you believe. And that's the reason why ethics, uh, Christian ethics is so complicated because it's not just a rationalistic attempt to find out what human capabilities and possibilities are. It's actually a, an attempt to discover what human beings were created for and what they are not adequately taking care of. In other words, uh, it's, uh, Christian ethics uh, and Jewish ethics are always beyond the grasp, so to speak, of human beings. And if they were not beyond the grasp, as, uh, as somebody said, then what is a heaven for? In other words, es Christian ethics are not only theological, they're eschatological. When we look back on the history of Christianity, it is not hard. And one of the jobs of a Christian uh, teacher is to point out how miserably, quite often, Christians, particularly what we sometimes call the church, though, though sometimes we use that expression, certainly media use that expression in a way that does not reflect the meaning of church, in Christian theology, but sometimes how miserable the church has been in being ethical or being or living up to the standards of Christianity, uh, and it doesn't it doesn't take a very uh, well versed historian to cite some of the instances. You know, we always hear about the Crusades, we hear about the Inquisition, we hear about the Holocaust, and we need to hear about those things because those are illustrations. This is what a lot of people don't understand. Those are illustrations of what Christian ethics, a Christian theology mean by sin. They're not illustrations of what Christian theology means by, by uh, morality or ethics. They're illustrations of what Christian theology means by sin. In other words, uh, there is a transcendent criterion in Jewish and Christian theology to which Jews and Christians never completely measure up. But they can still look to, to that criterion to see how they do not measure up. That's, uh, that's what the reformers and Augustine and Paul especially emphasized in looking at the law. Not that the law was good. The law is a criterion to which neither Jews or Christians or anyone else in the world can measure up. And that's the reason why uh, Christian ethics must be an uh, an ethics of grace, an ethics of uh, an eschatological ethic, which is looking forward to fulfillment. This relate this uh, whole thing relates to our subject for today, and that is the image of God. Quite often, uh, people discuss the image of God in a very superficial way, and they discuss things like sin and even the concept of original sin in a very superficial way. Um, one of the big, uh, pub almost the public, public enemy number one in the history of the United States has been John Calvin. And that's because a lot of our intellectuals in the second, third, fourth generation after Calvin were Calvinists who were in a sense in rebellion against uh, some of the extreme interpretations of Calvin. And so a lot of Americans, when they hear the word predestination or when they hear the word original sin they just go wild how in the world can a modern rational person believe in original sin I for instance was raised in a 
in a uh, religious group that is was descendant from the Puritans in certain ways, but in other ways it was very anti-Puritan. So our preachers in the church where I, when I was raised used to preach sermons against John Calvin and used to preach sermons against any concept of original sin. And uh, if they understood the doctrine of original sin correctly, then I suppose these sermons were warranted. But what I've discovered in studying Reformation theology, in studying Calvin, in studying the Bible, is that even though the, the expression original sin is not found in the Bible, all of the elements, all of the theological and spiritual elements of the idea of original sin are found in the Bible. But it's probably, as uh, some theologians have suggested, it's probably uh, more prudent for theologians not to use that word much anymore because it has been so uh, deprived of its original meaning and original intention that uh, people, people just don't believe that intelligent theologians can even have a doctrine of original sin. Well, you need to go back and read, for instance, probably the most uh, influential American theologian of the 20th century, who was Reinhold Niebuhr. And uh, if you read Reinhold Niebuhr, you will be reading a great deal about the doctrine of original sin. He even said toward the end of his life that he may have made a mistake continuing to use that expression because it is so misunderstood. But Niebuhr is the theologian who had the most impact, for instance, on, uh, on the Roosevelts, on Ke John Kennedy, on uh, Jimmy Carter, on uh, Martin Luther King, and all of these people. Uh, they were his theologian. And uh, so uh, even though Martin Luther King, for instance, would probably not use the expression original sin very much, he certainly used the expression sin, and he certainly understood human nature uh, in a more profound way because of his theological understanding of sin. Uh, he was able, for instance, to be more forgiving of people who are his enemies in the civil rights movement uh, because he understood that they were sinners, he was sinners, all of us are sinners in this whole thing and that's basically what original sin means. Original sin does not mean uh, that it happened a long time ago. That's not what original sin means. Original sin means that, that uh, something went wrong. There was first original goodness. If you don't understand that, then there's no use talking about original sin. There was first original goodness. God did not create us to be sinners. Sin is not a creation of God. And so original sin does not refer to the first thing to be said about human beings. The first thing to be said about human beings is that human beings are made in the image of God. And only then do you talk about what has obscured the image of God. What has uh, corrupted the image of God. What has perhaps even erased the image of God in some people? Because the image of God, as you've read, is not a substance which human beings are born with. It's not, for instance, the immortal soul of Plato. It's not even the brain or the rationality of uh, Aristotle. You can be one of the most rational people in the world and be one of the most evil people. So just being, just being very intelligent is not an expression of what the Bible means by being made in the image of God. Uh, we can name some very intelligent people whom we would not want to meet in a dark alley because they are not uh, acting, at least, in terms of their being in the image of God. Now, the, the first thing people think of when they think of the image of God is a physical likeness because that is the image of God in idolatry. That's the image of God in, in polytheism, in, uh, in magical religion, that God is either made in the image of a human being or he's made... Uh, in the image of an animal and so forth. In other words, when you run into, a, when you run into an idol, uh, even primitive people understood that that idol wasn't 
God. But that that idol was an image of God. And so that's the reason why very early in the writing of the Bible, Jews are forbidden even to make images. Particularly to make images of human beings. And there, was, there were to be no images of human beings in the temple because of the very uh, confusing way in which a human image uh, undercuts human understanding of the nature of God and what it means to be made in the image of God. To made, be made in the image of God does not mean to look like God. Human beings physically look more like mon monkeys than God. Human beings, yeah, people don't like to hear this, but I mean it's just the scientific fact. Human beings look more like chimpanzees than God. Their DNA is closer to chimpanzees than to God. In fact, their DNA doesn't have any contact with God. But it does have very close contact with monkeys and with all other uh, things. So uh, a human being doesn't look any more like God than a monkey does. In fact, a human being doesn't look any more like God than a slug does. That's not what the image of God means. Though if you listen to the way some modern people talk about God, you would think that he was a giant slug. You know, has no, has no, uh, uh, they, they just refuse to talk about God in any anthropomorphic, uh, using any kind of anthropomorphic character. Or even talk about God in terms of personality. Which means if God, uh, now this, this doesn't prove one way or another, whether there's a God. But if God is not at least personal, then any human being is a higher being than God, at least in, in spiritual terms. Uh, you can talk about God being super personal or super personal. But uh, if you don't talk about God at least as being personal, then you're not in contact with the Jewish and Christian tradition. Uh, you've latched on to something else. As C.S. Lewis used to say, uh, uh, God is sometimes, uh, some pe sometimes people's conception of God is that he's a giant tapioca pudding. Has no person, personality, has no uh, capacity to love, capacity to relate to people. Well, there's where you get into the image of God. If you find a human being who has the capacity, who, who loves and who relates and who is obedient and faithful to God uh, and how, however way that's understood and in, in the Christian perspective it's understood in a pretty um, in a per pretty narrow way but if you relate to God if you relate to other human beings particularly in love and forgiveness and so forth that is the image of God uh, one of the founders or precursors of modern existentialism is Pascal, the French uh, Roman Catholic theologian, a uh, monastic who talks in very stark terms about the nature of human beings. They're stark in the sense that if you take one of his, if you take one half of his description of what a human being is, you come out with modern liberalism. If you take the other half of what he says about human beings, you come out with modern atheistic existentialism. And so what makes Pascal so important in the history of Christian theology, just like Augustine and, and Luther and Calvin, is that they hold these two aspects of human being together. The Christian religion teaches, Pascal says, teaches men these two truths. And if you don't have these two truths together, then you're not going to be able to understand Christian ethics. That there is a God whom men can know and that there is a corruption in their nature which renders them unworthy of him. 
It is equally dangerous for man to know God without knowing his own wretchedness and to know his own wretchedness without knowing the Redeemer who can free him from it. Now we, modern people, even modern Christians and Jews, don't like that language. We don't like the word wretchedness. We don't like the word corruption in, 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 to, to be applied to human beings. Uh, I'm in situations all the time in which I'm not trying to convert anybody to any particular religious perspective, but I'll use the word sin. We are all sinners. And someone, sometimes very religious, will just react very negatively to that because they think that I'm saying that they are of no value whatsoever, that they are just rotten. And what we have to understand is, is that English, these, these are English words that used to mean something. And to say that human beings were wretched was not to say something uh, religious necessarily about human beings. It was to say what you saw every time you walked out in the streets. Imagine living in Paris in the 18th century or in London in the 18th century uh, and then walking out in the streets at night and seeing the wretchedness in human life. Uh, imagine going to some cities in the United States sometimes during the day without seeing the wretchedness of human life. That's not a judgment on individual human beings. That's a judgment on the fact that human beings uh, do things that land them in the newspapers in the morning. You understand? Human beings all over the world are doing things right now, which the best word to describe it is wretchedness. But we don't, we don't want to think of ourselves in that light. And so if the, if the, uh, if the uh, uh, Serbians are doing it, we, like, we can think of it as wretchedness, but we can't think of the Serbians being the same kind of human beings as we are. Are they Albanians or, or, or anyone? If they're doing things like this, then we think, we think somehow or another something has gone wrong with them. Well, the point, of the, image, the point of sin is that there is something gone wrong. It's something that's gone wrong with all human beings. And we have no basis for self-righteous self-righteousness. We have a basis perhaps for helping to protect the innocent and trying to, uh, trying, trying to raise the, uh, the moral tone of international relations and uh, try to do something to fight human beings' inhumanity to other human beings. But we have to do that humbly <laughs> because our, our ancestors did the same thing. There was, I saw a program the other day on C-SPAN and it was about a book written by um, the captain of the Mayflower and uh, they were doing the discussion of this book at the, at the village that has been built up uh, at Plymouth, Massachusetts and, and uh, one of my uh, favorite preachers whose name is Peter Gomes, who's the minister at Harvard University, preacher at Harvard Chapel, was, is, a, is a citizen of Plymouth. That's where he lives, and he's written a great deal on Puritans. And since he's kind of a liberal uh, Episcopalian, a lot of people assume that he has a not very profound conception of sin and Calvinism and so forth, but, to, but he understands the profundity of uh, these primitive people uh, in their understanding of human nature. That doesn't mean that everything they thought about human beings uh, is justifiable, but at least they understood human nature more than some of, some of the subsequent Americans have, and so as a result, a lot of subs subsequent Americans have gotten into all kinds of trouble being overly optimistic, almost utopian 
about what human beings can accomplish. And then every time we do that, we fall into some kind of mess. You know, something like Vietnam, something like the uh, Serbian War, something like World War II, something like World War I, happens every generation. Yet after each one of these things, we hope that something like this is never going to happen again. But what happens? It happens again. It happens again. And it's going to continue to happen again. And, and one of the most dangerous things is to be overly optimistic or utopian about it and not being realistic about it. We have to understand it can happen here. And it can happen again. Because human beings in the United States are no different, basically, from human beings in Germany in 1935. They're, no, they're, no, they're not basically different from Serbians in 1998 or 1999. Uh, so it can happen here, depending upon the circumstances. We have that capacity. And, um, and so when Pascal says you have to understand two things about human beings, that is, that they can know God, but they also need to know about the corruption that they face in their own nature. So uh, it is equally dangerous for man to know God without knowing his own wretchedness. That's utopianism. Uh, that's kind of idealistic liberalism. There are all kinds of ways in which this, this uh, expresses itself. That's, for instance, Marxism. Marxism doesn't particularly know God, but it also does not particularly know of its own wretchedness. It knows the wretchedness of the czars, and it knows the wretchedness of, uh, of the enemies. It's just like the French Revolution. Uh, the French revolutionaries were for you know, fraternity and liberty and so forth uh, and they knew who the real wretches were it wasn't them <laughs> it was the people who had the money it was the people in the aristocracy it was the people in the royalty so once you chop their heads off everything's going to be fine that's the difference between the um, the French Revolution and the American Revolution even though the French Revolution occurred after the American Revolution the French Revolution did not have a Puritan concept of sin. So it considered to be good guys, they considered that in this fight there were the good guys and the bad guys. And what you need to do is just chop off the heads of all the bad guys and then all will be left is what? Good guys. America, uh, fortunately, escaped that kind of political understanding of human nature because of the influence of Puritans. And Pascal is a Catholic Puritan. <laughs> He's also a Catholic uh, existentialist. But it's also equally dangerous to know our own wretchedness without knowing the Redeemer who can free him from it. A lot of Americans are, for instance, today reacting against what they call hell, fire, and damnation preaching. And a lot of hell, fire, and damnation preaching is, is very superficial preaching. And a lot of hell, fire, and damnation preaching was an art that some preachers developed just because their members wanted to come to church and feel beaten up on. You know, it, it, you, you feel more religious if you go to church and somebody beats up on you. You feel, you feel wretched and you feel sinful and so forth and so on. Well, the problem with that is that uh, these hell, fire, and damnation preachers were trying to imitate profound theologians like uh, Jonathan Edwards, but they weren't doing a very good job. Bec or, or Pascal, but they weren't doing a very good job or because... Uh, Pascal understood both of the sides of this thing. That is, that uh, man, human beings are made in the image of God, but that they are sinners. And if you believe that human beings are made in the image of God, but do not understand his sin, 
then you will you will be overly optimistic, overly utopian, and you will you will not know. It, it will catch you by surprise when something like the Holocaust takes place, or something like Nazism takes place, or something like uh, Cambodia took place. Cambodia is a good example because if you study, if you read the lives of the of Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, one one of the one of the striking things, one of the things that strikes you. In fact, this is very appealing to some people when they read it, is that Pol Pot was a was an idealist. He was an extremely committed idealist. He was committed to the Marxist, Leninist, Pol Pot ideal. He, for instance, never made any money off of his political activity. Uh, I forget the, the amount of money it was estimated that he lived on yearly, but it, you know, it was just a few thousand dollars a year. Whereas people down in in the capital of Cambodia, who were in the government, were living on, you know, just tons of money. But here was Pol Pot. He never had very much money. So if you just look at him from the perspective of what his intentions are, he is highly idealistic. But when you look at what the results are, it's the most horrible, one of the most horrible episodes in human history. Because what he was trying to do was to get rid of the bad guys. And the more you look for bad guys, the more of them you find. You don't get rid of yourself because you're the good guy. <laughs> and you don't get rid of everybody that's loyal to you because they're the good guys. But there, there is this possibility of human beings being so idealistic like the... Uh, like the, the promoters of the French Revolution, so idealistic that when you look at a film made about what they did, it is so horrifying you can't watch it. So it's dangerous to consider the great uh, dignity of human beings and their rationality and so forth without understanding the possibility of their wretchedness. And it's also dangerous to know our own wretchedness without knowing the Redeemer. In these fire and brimstone sermons, if the whole purpose of the sermon is just to beat up on you and make you feel like a worm, then it's not a gospel sermon. It's not a Christian sermon. In fact, you don't usually have to spend much time uh, convincing people that they are sinners. You just have to explain it to them a little bit. <laughs> you, know, just, you just have to get them, get them to understanding uh, where they stand in relationship to other people and where they stand in relationship to all other human beings and so forth. And it's not hard to get people to understand uh, that they are sinners. Uh, that can usually take place with just a kind of a an instant uh, revelation or an instant uh, uh, acknowledgement. But the purpose for telling people they're sinners is not to make them feel bad the rest of their lives. The purpose for telling people that they're sinners is to tell them that there is a redemption available. And there have been lots of good movies in the last few years that have had as their major theme redemption. There are a lot of novels American novels that have as their major theme redemption, even written by people who don't believe in religion. But they realize that if there's no redemption, then, uh, then we've got real problems. The knowledge of only one of these points gives rise either to the pride of philosophers who have known God and not their own wretchedness, or to the despair of atheists who know their own wretchedness but not the Redeemer, or not the possibility of redemption. 
A philosopher, for instance, who claimed no God but not his own wretchedness, you'd probably pick out somebody like uh, Hegel. A philosopher who uh, despaired of his own wretchedness, you'd probably pick out a philosopher like Sartre or Camus. To pick out someone, to, to pick out a group of people who were philosopher types, but who had both of these ideas in their writing and their thinking, you'll have to look at Pascal, you'll have to look at Kierkegaard, you'll have to look at Dostoevsky. And a lot of people don't like to read Dostoevsky. A lot of Christian people don't like to read Dostoevsky because he reminds them of their wretchedness. But in, in reminding people of their wretchedness, Dostoevsky also reminds them of redemption. There are some authors like uh, Samuel Beckett who reminds people of their wretchedness, but he has no word for them about redemption in waiting for Godot and so forth. But uh, there are, and there are authors like Sartre and Camus who remind people of their wretchedness uh, but they, the only redemption they offer is whatever redemption human beings per se can generate. But then there are other authors, and these are Christian existentialist authors like Dostoevsky, uh, Martin Buber. Uh, he's a Jewish existentialist theologian who, who uh, are, not, uh, do, are not unknowing about the human condition yet at the same time realize that, uh, that uh, there is redemption possible. And from their perspective, the redemption that's possible is redemption in light of relationship with God. That's the basis, for instance, of... Uh, of modern 12-step programs, such as Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, it's possible to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous today. In fact, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, people who are not religious in the sense of believing in God are very welcome in Alcoholics Anonymous. But on the other hand, Alcoholics Anonymous does not change its teaching. Its teaching is what about God? That without depend without your acknowledgments of your dependent on a higher power you're not going to be redeemed you're not going to be saved you know you need to understand what the word redeemed and saved is if you want to understand what the word redeemed and saved is a good place to go is to an alcoholics anonymous meeting it doesn't just mean going to church every sunday it means having your life rescued having your spirit rescued having your whole being rescued. And so the founders of the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, one was a Roman Catholic, one was a Protestant, they founded it basically on Pauline theology. That is, uh, the necessity for the acknowledgement of being sinners, although they don't use the word sinner in AA. When you go to AA, you don't go up and say, I am a sinner. What do you say? You have to say it. I am an alcoholic. Because if you don't say it, then you're not ready to be helped by either God or by your fellow alcoholic, alcoholics. And that's what's supposed to happen in, in Jewish and Christian worship. And that, that is what happens technically, but... but uh, we, uh, if we're going to participate in this, we have to ask ourselves, is that what's really happening in our own, in our own consciousness? Are we really acknowledging, every time, every time somebody goes to church or to synagogue, uh, they're acknowledging the greatness of God and the sinfulness of human beings and the need for the goodness of God and the grace of God to uh, make up for what we can't do. But, but uh, 
you know and I know and everybody else who knows anything about it knows that there are people who go to church who do not, who do not believe they're sinners, even if they say they are. And uh, uh, one of the most dangerous people in the church is a person who doesn't think he's a sinner. That's that's self righteousness. He's going to be a he's going to be a uh, harmful impediment to the whole purpose for a for a local Christian community. Uh, we can have an excellent knowledge of God without that of our own wretchedness. Well, of course, you might argue about his use of the word knowledge of God because in the biblical sense, if you have an excellent knowledge of God, then you know your own wretchedness. That's, that's the only way you can know it. But we cannot know Jesus Christ without knowing at the same time both God and our own wretchedness. So that's where he straightens out that idea. There's a kind of a knowledge of God which is an intellectual activity. And the New Testament doesn't, is not very high on that concept of the knowledge of God. In fact, the word knowledge is never used in that sense in the Bible, except in one place. When you look through the whole Old Testament, you'll find that the word knowledge does not primarily mean intellectual or rational activity. That's what it primarily means in our culture because of our Greek background. But that's not what it primarily means in the Bible. The first use of the word knowledge, for instance, in the Bible is where? Genesis 2. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, a lot of people think the knowledge of good and evil is knowledge of right from wrong. That's not what knowledge of good and evil is. Adam and Eve knew right from wrong before they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the knowledge of good and evil is something different from not knowing right from wrong. Knowing right from wrong is an intellectual, rational activity. Knowing good and evil is an, ex is an existential, experiential activity. The second place in which the word knowledge is used in the Bible. Anybody remember that? Genesis 4. Adam knew Eve. Well, what does that mean? That Eve was introduced to Adam in chapter 4 of Genesis? No. That means that Adam had the most profound knowledge relationship that human beings can have with each other. Adam had a sexual relationship with Eve, uh, which, as we've already seen, was not the original sin. <laughs> Uh, it was the original commandment. So when in chapter 4, when Adam knew Eve, he wasn't committing another sin, as a lot of people uh, later interpreted. What he was doing was having a relationship which, is, which transcends rational. It transcends the intellect. It includes the whole person. So it is not a circumlocution. The Bible was not written... Uh, to be used in Sunday school. You know, if we, if we teach our kindergarten and first and second grade children to, to the Bible, we have to clean it up because the Bible was not written, uh, you know, as children's stories. There are no children's stories in the Bible. They are extremely profound whether they're true or not, they're extremely profound attempts to analyze the human condition. The story of Noah and Ark is my granddaughter's favorite story. She even gave me a tie, which is a beautiful work of art with Noah and all the little animals. Because that's a cute little story. But it's not a children's story. It has to be cleaned up. Just like Walt Disney has to clean up all of the fairy tales in order to present them to children. Because fairy tales are not children's stories. They've only become children's stories in recent 
they, they only became children's stories during the Victorian era when they started putting fairy tales in children's books. Fairy tales are originally adult stories. That's why they're so horrible in some ways. You know, the story of Hansel and Gretel, what, what happens? Little kids get eaten, you know. Uh, the story of uh, Red Riding Hood, what happens? You know, you've got a wolf that eats grandma. And, you, and not only that, but you have, a, uh, you, you have to call in the uh, hatchet man to uh, chop the wolf into pieces and so forth. Uh, just look at all of the stories that we call fairy tales, and we think of fairy tales as children's stories. But these fairy tales are more profound than that. They're stories that were told for adults, by adults, around campfires, among our ancestors, before they became literate. And they've just been kind of relegated to children's stories. The same thing has happened to the Bible. So if you think there is a story in the Bible about two people who ate an apple 6,000 years ago and therefore we all die, there's no such story in the Bible. If it was, it wouldn't be a children's story. But there's no such story in the Bible. The story that's in the Bible is a more profound one than that. Whether it's true or not, it's a more profound one than that. So knowledge is a more profound experience than just intellectual knowledge. So when the Bible says uh, that, that, the, uh, that one group of people does not know me, God says through a prophet, you do not know me, it's not that they don't know he exists. That wasn't a question. It's that they do not know him, relationship. They are not participating in the relationship with God for which he created them. And so when, it's, when it promises that in the eschaton or in the new age, you shall know him, that's talking about an existential, experiential knowledge. Uh, and when Paul talks about the eschaton, he says the things that we now experience, you know, will kind of fade away. But then we shall know as we are known. In other words, from Paul's perspective, God already knows us, not intellectually, but he knows us profoundly, relationally, personally. Uh, and we shall, be, we shall know as we are known. In the meantime, we have no basis upon which to judge one another because we don't really know one another. Even somebody we've been married to for 30 years. We don't know them well enough to judge them. So knowledge is a very profound uh, idea in the Bible. So you can consider knowledge of God to be one way of describing the image of God. But it's not knowledge of God in the sense of being rational. There's nothing wrong in the Bible with being intelligent. But being intelligent doesn't get you any points in heaven. You know, because you're more intelligent, because you're a rational being, that doesn't mean that God loves you more than somebody who's not. Uh, what God wants from the biblical perspective is a relationship. So for that reason, any church or any religious community worth its salt will be very welcoming to people, for instance, who, who uh, are very low on the intelligence scale. Whereas, uh, uh, what are these societies for people who can only make so much on, a, on an IQ test? Um, those things, I'm not saying that anybody's a member of one of those societies is not a, not a Christian, but that, that tendency is a non-Christian tendency to think of people, to think of yourself or to think of other people, their value totally on, on how smart they are. That's what philosophy tends to do. But that's not a re what a redemptive faith does. So we cannot know Jesus Christ without knowing at the same time both God and our own wretchedness. Some, one will ask, do not Christians believe that man was created in the image of God? Is not the doctrine of the image of God one of the basic principles of Christian morality? Uh, on, this is on page 249 of your book, Ramsey. He goes on to say, 
certainly this must be affirmed and cannot be denied. Unfortunately, however, there is a widespread opinion that the notion of the Imago Dei has been simply a peculiar religious manner of expression or archaic way of saying what other interpretations of human nature manage to say more clearly. That's, what's happened, that's what happened to lots of Christian theology in the 19th century. Uh, and this is the kind of Christian theology which is sometimes called liberalism with a capital L. Now there are, there, there are ways in which, uh, there are a lot of ways in which that word liberalism can be defined. But in Christian theology, many times, the, uh, some 19th century theology is called liberalism or modernism because it is a phase in the history of theology in which theologians were running scared, so to speak, of modern science and of modern, uh, uh, modern thought forms, modern philosophy, modern rationality. And uh, now that we live in a postmodern age, uh, there's there, kind of room has been, it's, you have kind of room left open now to go back and to consider the meaning of some of these ideas because they didn't just fall down out of heaven and they weren't, they weren't ideas which, uh, which were just religious. No word used in Christian theology was originally religious except the word God. And you can even argue whether that's a religious word. Redemption was not originally a religious word. Redemption means to pay the price to rescue somebody. It was used mostly in the Old Testament to refer to rescuing slaves. That's the reason why slaves are prostitutes. You know, Hosea went, went and paid the redemption price in order to get his wife because she was already a prostitute. It's an interesting story you might want to read. Uh, if, you wanted to pay, if you wanted to get a slave out of slavery, or if you wanted to get yourself out of slavery, you had to come up with the redemption price. Uh, when I was a kid, there were redemption stores all over town. You all don't remember those. <laughs> But uh, there were S and H green stamps, and all kinds of things. Where if you bought things, you got these green stamps, and you went to a redemption center. Well, that's the original meaning of the word. It wasn't re now, if you see a redemption center in town, it's usually a church. But uh, they didn't call churches redemption centers back then. Uh, the redemption centers were H and S and H green stamps and other kind of redemption centers. And you got you got coupons to redeem in, in all cigarettes. If you bought a carton of cigarettes, then you'd have 12 coupons. Uh, that means that you've got something valuable there that you can go redeem something with. And so it's natural that when the Bible thinks about a term to refer to what God does to the people of Israel when he brings them out of Egypt, you can say, you can simply say, God went and snatched people of Israel out of Egypt. Or you can say God redeemed his people. And so then it becomes kind of a theological term, but, but it only comes, becomes a theological term because it already has meaning. And you're just trying to figure out a word to, or, or a concept to express that meaning. The same as with the word covenant. The word covenant already existed before it was used as a... Uh, as a, to talk about the relationship between God and human beings. The word love was already used before it was talked about as a theological concept. The word grace. Um, again, using this, it, some people think that the word grace is simply a peculiar religious manner of expression or an archaic way of saying what other interpretations of human nature manage to say more clearly. Well, that means that a lot of people, because they think of grace as a religious word, you know, everybody knows the song Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, and some people want to sing it because they really have experienced grace. Other people want to sing it because it's nostalgic and traditional and uh, country music, and other, other people uh, don't want to sing it at all because it smacks of religion. Well, the problem is, 
even if you don't want to sing that song at all, does that mean that, there, that you show no grace in your family? Does that mean that you are not treating your children with grace? If you're not, then you're going to be in trouble. You're going to raise people that you don't want to live next to. Because everyone has to experience grace. And if they don't, then we're going to read about them in the newspapers. And so grace is already a word, you know, mercy, grace, unmerited favor, unmerited favor. Uh, but that's the only kind of word that can be used to describe the character of the God that Christians and Jews worship. You, may, you can use other terms. You can use uh, the steadfast love of the Lord or the, the mercies of God or, or unmerited favor. Unmerited favor, in fact, is not even found as an expression in the Bible. It's, what, it, what it is is you put together two or three words, you know, unmerited favor unconditional love and these all mean the same thing but they're attempts to try to uh, explain a relationship they're symbolic which means they point to something that's real they don't comprehend it completely in fact some people who use the term have no comprehension of what it means and even people who use the term don't comprehend what it means completely they kind of know it when they see it but they don't comprehend it completely. Two types of theory regarding the image of God may first be distinguished. Two ways of thinking about human beings according to which may be classified most of the traditional discussions about human nature. One is that human beings are in some way substantially in the image of God. That is that there is a substantial form of human nature within human beings. Uh, this may be expressed, for instance, in the traditional Platonic notion of the immortality of the soul or in the Stoic notion of the spark of divinity in man. I don't know how many people I hear, uh, Christians, uh, you know, Episcopalians, uh, Jews, Roman Catholics, talking about the spark of divinity in man. Well, that is a perfectly wonderful expression but it's not a Christian expression it's not a biblical expression it does not comprehend any biblical notion it's an attempt to ground the dignity and the value of human beings in the fact that they are divine that they are God and that is not where the Bible grounds human dignity uh, Sometimes it's some faculty or capacity that man possesses, just like we were talking about intelligence. The tendency in, in, in uh, Western philosophy is to think of, in, of higher intelligence as having more soul. That's the difference between men and animals, for instance. That's not the difference between men and animals in the Bible. And that's the irony of the thing. You know, a great many... Uh, environmentalists and animal lovers and tree huggers in America assume that it's Christianity that has divided so starkly and radically between human beings and other animals. Well, that is true to a certain extent. To the extent that Christianity has adopted the Greek notion of the soul. And transferred it into a kind of a Christian notion that the only reason why human beings are valuable is because they have immortal souls. Well, that wasn't even the Greek idea. The Greeks believed that uh, monkeys had souls. But that they just weren't high enough on the hierarchy. Well, cr what Christians did was to take this concept of a substantial soul and make that the primary criteria of what being human is. And the interesting thing is that 19th century liberalism, both Protestant and Jewish, latched on to this conception of a substantial soul as being the most important thing about a human being. And they did so by, by uh, 
uh, coming to the conclusion that the Jewish Christian concept of the resurrection of the body, that is the resurrection of the whole person, was too primitive and unscientific. Well, if you convince a whole generation that the concept of resurrection is too primitive and unscientific and that the only thing that makes human beings different from other people is the soul, then what happens after you've cut on people for about a hundred years and can't find a soul? Then you've lost both. You've lost both. What happens when you stick a pin in a person's brain and it changes his personality? There goes the soul, you know. If, you're, if your concept of the soul is based primarily on, on rational faculty. The Bible, in fact, uses the word soul to apply to all living beings. What makes a person, a human being, different from an animal is not that one has a soul and the other doesn't. The difference, in fact, the difference is not that one has a relationship to God and the other doesn't. The difference is on what kind of relationship you have to God. And we are not even given information on what relationship a dolphin has to God. That's really, from the biblical perspective, not much of our business. We are given information on, on how a human being is to be related to God because a human being is made in the image of God in some way in which other animals are not. And that's, that's what we need to concentrate on from the biblical perspective, what it means to be made in the image of God. But that doesn't downgrade the goodness or the importance of animals. One of the Ten Commandments is a commandment for the well-being of animals. So one-tenth of the laws of Israel <laughs> uh, are for the benefit of animals. That's the Sabbath law. You don't have a right to mistreat animals just because you're made, quote, in the image of God. Because animals also belong to God. And God loves animals. He takes care of animals. That's the whole biblical idea. Every time we go to church, uh, every time people go to church, they uh, sing a song, something like, you know, uh, how the rocks praise God, the trees praise God, everything praises God. Well, those are taken from the Psalms. How does a rock praise God? By being a rock. How does a tree praise God? By being a tree. How does a human being praise God? The only animal in the universe that can refuse to praise God, as far as we know, is a human being. How can a human being, uh, how does a human being praise God? By being a human being. In other words, it is a tremendous responsibility from the biblical perspective being a human being. And none of us have yet risen to the task. That's in Christianity the meaning of the incarnation. That is that Jesus comes to show us what it means to be a human being. Because he comes to show us what God is like. Because Jesus is the image of God. See how all these things are related. So for Christianity, the way you become, the way you uh, become the image of God is to is to uh, become the image of God that you see and you experience in Jesus Christ. He is the image of God. He's the new Adam. We all we already are born into the old Adam. Everybody that's born is Adam. But we are not new Adam until we are, quote, born again into the new Adam. Until we begin to participate in the resurrection and, we, in which, and when we begin to participate again in what it means to be in the image of God. So whether or not Jesus is who he claims to be or whether or not he is who the early church claims him to be, that's what he represents for the early church is the coming of the image of God back into human life. 
so we'll know what it means to be human. Christians, lots of Christians still, focus so much on the divinity of Christ, which is not a biblical expression, that they forget the humanity of God, which is the primary uh, message of Jesus, is that God has become human, that a human being is made in the image of God, and so that's who Jesus Christ is, the image of God. And so from the New Testament perspective, if you want to look around at what the image of God is, you can see it faintly in your fellow human beings, but you see it more, most clearly in Jesus Christ. So, uh, a, a, a great deal of the talk about the in, image of God is something to distinguish man from the physical nature and from other animals, and that's not what the image of God is supposed to do. The image of God is supposed to say something uh, specific about human beings, which does make him different from physical things and other animals, but it doesn't mean that he, he ceases to be physical or that he ceases to be an animal. It means that he has a relationship which is, uh, which is characterized by certain things. More frequently, however, some inner capacity of mind or soul or will as identified as the image of God within man. The ancient Stoics spoke, up, spoke of a divine spark. Sometimes, uh, uh, and, and this is a very popular way of speaking these days. This is a way of speaking about Christianity which was introduced into Christianity in the 19th century primarily by Unitarians and by, and by Protestant uh, liberals. That is that what distinguishes human beings is that they have this spark of divinity. And that's also, this spark of divinity is also the hinge upon which a great deal of modern New Age doctrine hangs, which is the reason why it, it, it fits so well with a great many Christians' pre-understanding of what a human being is, that a human being is a spark of divinity. So all you have to do is go in there and find that little spark. And so uh, New Age uh, teachers, for instance, can talk about Jesus, they can talk about the Holy Spirit. And they can do this in a Presbyterian church or they can do it in an Episcopalian church and people will sit there thinking, I'm hearing the Bible. Well, just because you hear the word Jesus and Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're hearing the Bible. What is the content of those words? If you mean by Jesus a Jesus principle, which Jesus had because everybody else has it if they'll just look for it. Or if you mean by the Holy Spirit, the, your own spirit, if you'll just recognize it as the Holy Spirit. There was an advertisement I just saw on TV before I came, came to class this morning. An advertisement for something, some vitamin or something. And it said, your body is a temple. Well, that's an interesting expression. It's an expression that comes from Paul. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But it's not, it's, uh, but when an advertisement for vitamins use it, they're not meaning the same thing that it means when, uh, when Paul uses it. That's what I'm saying. You have to understand what the language is, what is the content of the language uh, in order to understand what somebody's saying. So when, when, uh, Deepak Chopra, for instance, talks about God, he may be the only person person in the United States who really knows God. But when he talks about God, he's not talking about the same thing as Paul is talking about, or as Moses is talking about, or as Isaiah is talking about. And, and he may be right and Moses wrong, but at least we need to understand the difference between them. The idea that there is a spark of the divine in every man, the Stoic notion, gave rise to our modern conceptions of the inherent natural sacredness of human personality as much as or more than did Christianity. Because the source of our concept of the sacredness of humanity, of the human personality, is different in these two views. 
Aristotle's definition of man as a rational animal may be cited as the understanding or the outstanding example of ways of thinking about man which specifies some capacity, some substantial part of human nature as the essence of what it means to be in the image of God. The first type of theory concerning the Imago Dei may be criticized for its proneness to blur the distinction between man and God. Anytime I'm asked to speak on New Age, my purpose is not to attack defenders and proponents of New Age. My, opponent, my purpose is to try to distinguish between two religions. Judaism and Christianity on the one hand and New Age on the other. And as I say, I have no basis upon which to declare either one of them the one that you should be a believer in. All I'm trying to do is show what the difference is if you believe one or if you believe the other. Seeking to, and, and my main problem, usually the first sentence I say is, if you want to to understand the difference between traditional Judaism and Christianity or biblical Christianity and biblical Judaism and most New Age, you have to understand there is a line between human beings and God. There is a line between human beings and God. So any theology which elaborates on the blurring of that line uh, can be classified as New Age or, or philosophical or whatever. Uh, Seeking to provide a barrier against the naturalistic reduction of man to the dead level of physical or animal nature, these views fall into the era of exalting man to the level of the divine. To put it simply, from the Jewish Christian view, I am not God. There's nothing wrong with not being God. I am a human being. There's nothing wrong with being a human being. Being a human being is to be made in the image of God. That's all, that's the highest that a human being can expect. If he didn't start out as God, he's not going to become God somewhere along the way. If he started out as a part of creation, he's going to be a part of creation as long as he exists. And so basically, uh, what we need to do is deal with it. You know, we are not God. We are human beings. And, uh, and, and surely we're not going to blame God for what human beings do. That's the reason why people who believe that human beings are God have to believe that all, that all history and all physical things are illusion. Judaism and Christianity can affirm the reality of history, the reality of physical things. Judaism and Christianity can condemn the Holocaust as something that really happened and was horrible, was anti-Christ, was anti-God, instead of just the Holocaust was an illusion. Yes? This substantial aspect of the image of God seems to have roots back in mysticism or in the, the, the mystical aspect of monasticism and I'm just wondering if this really carrying over into today if it shouldn't be more more I guess uh, uh, analyzed and, and recognized that it, you know it's, it's avenging almost upon an idolatry in a way well uh, you know I hate to use that kind of language uh, uh, because of its uh, emotional content, but in, but in a sense, Christ, Christians and Jews both believe that if I consider myself to be God, then that's idolatry. Obviously, that doesn't seem so bad to a great many people, so you have to, uh, you have to assume that, uh, that they won't like it if they're called idolaters. But uh, from the Jewish Christian perspective, you, substituting anything for God that is not God is what idolatry means. That's also basically what sin is. And, um, uh, but again, that doesn't mean that one group of people, because of their belief, are more sinful than other groups of people. The, the whole Christian conception is the universality of sin. 
the universality tendency to universal tendency to idolatry, and therefore the in, universal tendency to sac sacrifice others to yourself as God. Now I got a wonderful letter uh, last week from a man who had been a uh, Protestant but has since become an Orthodox, an Orthodox Christian. And uh, he wrote an, a, a very good letter talking about the value of monasticism and mysticism. And I have to say that uh, when I was growing up, I grew up in a very anti-mystical, anti-monastic uh, religious perspective. Uh, and I have learned to appreciate the value of monasticism and mysticism. And I'm not judgmental about it. Uh, but on the other hand, I think you're correct that uh, whether or not monasticism and mysticism is a, uh, is a uh, positive element in Christian faith, it is not an element in Christian faith that came from the Bible. That's all I'm saying. And so that it's quite possible for Christians, uh, as Ramsey believes, to be fully Christian without having much tendency toward mysticism. I will also agree that since I am not God and I'm not the Pope and I'm not the head of the church, that, uh, that other people have different experiences. And that these experiences are, uh, are, I can't judge the validity of them. And some, some of these experiences uh, do good for the world and do good for human beings. But, but Ramsey certainly believes, uh, and Luther and other Protestants believed, that mysticism is a form of religion which focuses too much on direct, direct, uh, direct, the direct vision of God, which from the biblical perspective is not a possibility for human beings. Uh, as John says, how can you love God whom you haven't seen if you don't love human beings made in the image of God whom you have seen. So from my way of speaking, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, uh, completely downgrading or denying this man's religious expression. I'm just saying that from the biblical perspective, uh, you have both, but the emphasis is upon the love of God, I mean the love of human beings, and, the, and as Ramsey puts it, the love of human beings unmerited favor toward human beings, and faith, trust, and obedience toward God, thankfulness toward God. I, find it, I, I, I don't find it difficult at all to be thankful to God, but I find it difficult to figure out how to be mystically related to God. And since I find it difficult, uh, I rejoice when other people don't find it difficult, but I don't expect it of my of uh, people that I'm trying to tell uh, what the Bible is saying, if you understand the distinction I'm making. There is another approach to the problem, and that is relational. Substantial versus relational. And I have been talking about the relational all, the, all along. So. It's not that we haven't got to this. We haven't got to it and, we're, and our time is about up. But relational, a relational conception of the image of God means that it's not a substance you look for inside yourself. It's something that you can see in your action. It's something that you can see in your obedience. It's something you can see in your conformity to Jesus Christ. But it's relational. That means that the image of God, from the, from the biblical perspective, can almost be erased in some people. It's still a possibility, but it's a possibility only by the grace and the gift of God. 
So that's, again, the reason why the emphasis is not on what you can get, find inside yourself, but upon what you receive from God, what you receive in your relationship from God. That's the same thing with your parents. Uh, grace was not something they, you know, they gave you in a, in a bowl and you ate. Grace was a relationship they had with you. So what you receive from your, the love you receive from your parents is not something that they discovered inside you. It's something that they learned, that you learned from them. There's, South Pacific is being revived, and there's a thing in South Pacific that says you've got to be carefully taught to be a racist. From Christian perspective, that's the wrong way around. You have to be taught to share. You have to be taught not to be a racist. Otherwise, you're just naturally going to be one. That's the meaning of sin. Okay.